let's just think about uh, the most successful approach in alloy design because you know the alloys exist already uh, and you have to think about why do we need any new concepts and the most successful approach in alloy design is when we have one element as a solvent and then we add small concentrations of other elements which we call solutes you know solvent and solutes quite an easy concept about making a solid solution and these are the very successful metallic materials that already exist uh, there's about two billion tons of these alloys manufactured each year so we must be doing something very correct in using these alloys uh, and steels magnesium alloys aluminum alloys titanium alloys and nickel alloys form a part of our everyday life and improve the quality of life so these contain dilute concentrations of various solutes which have dramatic effects on the base solvent so in the case of steels that's iron in the case of nickel based alloys that's nickel and so on so why do we use only small quantities of solute in making the normal alloys which are so successful that we consume roughly 2 billion tons every year well the first thing is that we often don't need large concentrations because by adding a very small concentration and combining that with thermomechanical processing we can achieve quite spectacular properties so you must be familiar with micro alloyed steels where the word micro means very small so we add very small concentrations of things like niobium titanium etc to steel and it has a dramatic effect on the mechanical properties in particular the toughness of the material for a given level of strength the second uh, basic point is that we have to worry about cost when we are talking about engineering materials because if we add a large concentration of alloying ad additions that will increase the cost of the material and I'll go into some numbers later when we come to discuss high entropy alloys. The third, uh, third in this list is that it is no longer acceptable. It is no longer acceptable to make alloys starting with just raw materials. When we finish making use of engineering components, we need to recycle them. And recycling is easiest when you have only small concentrations of solutes. But if you have, for example, you know, 20% cobalt and so on in your material, then you have to design a process which will extract them out because the vast majority of materials that we use are not rich in alloying elements. You have to think about engineering requirements as well. Can we join the materials together because if you can't join them then you cannot make large engineering structures and very often we are interested in extremely large uh, engineering structures like bridges and ships and so on so we are not talking about alloys which are simply studied in in isolation within a laboratory but we actually want to make use of these materials and we can make use of them by limiting the amount of solute that you put inside your material and finding ingenious ways of processing the materials to achieve the right sort of properties. Now, what do we mean by properties? Uh, we don't want to fall into the trap that we study a material, we identify a single property, for example, you know, strength, and then say, okay, we have discovered a fantastic new material. You need to think about a whole bank of properties before you can make something. So for example, we have toughness in its uh, various forms. Uh, this is the Charpy impact toughness. Then we have the fracture toughness properties. 
the fatigue properties, the corrosion properties, tensile properties. And if you're making a biological material, that means a material that you will implant into a, a human body, then you've got to be extremely careful that that material not only has structural integrity, because you don't want it to break up inside your body, but also it doesn't have a negative reaction with all the fluids, etc., which are in your body. Okay, so it is it is really important that we don't claim success before we assess what we want to make and what are the properties required for that. And one of the major advantages of dilute alloys is that we can process them on a very large scale. So Professor Chakrabarti mentioned at the very beginning that processing is an issue uh, that hasn't been studied sufficiently with high entropy alloys, whereas with the dilute alloys that I listed, we can actually make incredibly large quantities and use them successfully. So why do we bother with concentrated alloys because high entropy alloys, uh, as you will see later, have large concentrations of various uh, materials mixed together to form a cocktail of elements uh, to constitute the alloy of interest. So why do we bother with concentrated alloys? This is a slide that shows the um, dishes which collect radio signals from space and this is located in Cambridge and many many decades ago a PhD research student called Jocelyn Bell discovered periodic signals from space okay now when you discover periodic signals from space you get very excited because where are these periodic signals coming from is it another form of life that is trying to communicate with us and this work was done purely out of curiosity that means they're not particularly looking for any application but looking into space to see what sort of signals radio signals we can get this was this was if you like the start of radio astronomy as opposed to astronomy using light telescopes so she discovered these periodic signals coming from space and the sources uh, were labeled as LGM. LGM stands for little green men, right? So, you know, we used to think of aliens at li as little green men, and therefore these were called LGM1, LGM2, the different sources of periodic signals. And it turned out that, uh, you know, the, this was actually uh, a set of signals coming from pulsars, which are two, two uh, bodies rotating about each other and therefore we get a periodic radio signal from space. Completely out of curiosity, the work done led to the discovery of pulsars in, in the universe. So sometimes it is good to simply do research because you want to discover unexpected ideas. And that is how high entropy alloys actually started. Brian Cantor uh, in 1981 decided, look, why don't we study for the sake of studying a 20 component alloy, right? And people didn't think it was a good idea, but he nevertheless started an undergraduate project with uh, this uh, student, uh, Vincent, to look at 20 component alloys in which you have equal amounts of all the different solutes okay uh, and his idea was simply to look at multi-component alloys and see what happens okay no particular application in mind or, or anything uh, that would indicate that we are looking towards a component and his goal, therefore, was to study multi-component alloys. And by multi-component, he means, you know, where the solute concentrations are roughly in equal amounts. Uh, in uh, Taiwan, uh, Professor Ye, who's pictured here, he uh, was thinking somewhat differently, that he wants to make 
an alloy which would have a high entropy of mixing because that would favor the formation of a single solid solution. And he too started with uh, uh, an undergraduate student uh, who was a master's student to work on this. So these were not very big projects, etc. And back in 2004, these two papers were published uh, uh, simultaneously, as Professor Chakrabarti explained, with the Ye work, Professor Ye's work, emphasizing high entropy, okay? Because his idea was that the high entropy would lead to a single solid solution, even though we have many different solutes inside our material. And he was looking at something like five component alloys. And Brian Cantor's also published at the same time to investigate multi-component alloy phase space. So these two phrases are the key phrases that we are looking at a high entropy of mixing and we are looking at the multi-component alloy phase space, which, which hasn't been explored as much as, for example, for the dilute alloys that we use in our everyday life. And this picture here is an optical micrograph of this, of this 20 component alloy containing all of these elements, although the major elements were chromium, cobalt, nickel, iron, and manganese. And obviously we don't have a single phase. But the interesting observation was that one of the phases in this microstructure which was rich in chromium, cobalt, nickel, iron, and manganese, in spite of having large concentrations of all these elements, ended up with a face-centered cubic crystal structure. That means you have an atom at every corner of the unit cell, and you have an atom at the center of each phase, rather like the structure of austenite in iron or the structure of copper or of nickel. So, even though that phase is multi-component with large concentrations, almost equal concentrations of chromium, cobalt, nickel, iron, and manganese, it ends up with a single crystal structure. And you know, that is something to think about because as I will show you later, the individual components actually have a variety of crystal structures, and yet you end up with FCC. And FCC is a good structure to have in the sense that it has, you know, 24 different slip systems on 111 planes and in the 110 directions and that gives you quite a lot of ductility and in general an FCC structure does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature uh, like uh, BCC iron has uh, simply because you know it is a closed back structure and therefore uh, there isn't a large barrier to uh, pushing planes of atoms over one another. In other words, the flow stress is not very temperature sensitive and therefore it never exceeds, in general, the cleavage stress of the crystal structure. So this is something uh, exciting and something to look at. And we'll, we'll talk about this particular alloy system quite a lot. It is one of the most studied alloy systems in the high entropy alloy uh, um, collection. And it's often known as the Cantor alloy after Brian Cantor. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, many, many questions to consider. And one approach to answering these questions is to use thermodynamics to better understand concentrated alloys. And bear in mind that we don't have all the thermodynamic data that we need. Okay. So even when we use thermodynamics, we have to rely on concepts very often rather than quantitative predictions when using packages like thermocalc or empty data and so on. So the sort of questions that need to be answered in the context of high entropy alloys is why do we get a solid solution in spite of the fact that we have large concentrations of each of the components of the alloy? What determines the crystal structure that we get when we get a solid solution? Uh, should we have 
just a single phase or is a two phase structure acceptable in high entropy alloys uh, and is the material stable in other words will we get some sort of precipitation and there are many other questions that we can ask and you'll see those questions being addressed as we go through the set of lectures so somebody needs to mute themselves there's a bit of background noise coming through okay so please all of you should meet mute yourself so we are going to begin with uh, thermodynamics but as i show you uh, the design process can include many different techniques and bear in mind that this is a set of three lectures so you won't learn everything today right so we go on to thermodynamics and oops, this is the basic equation of thermodynamics that when we mix elements together there's a free energy of mixing this is the gibbs free energy of mixing at constant pressure there will be a change in enthalpy when we mix elements together so enthalpy uh, comes for example from the fact that you know if we have a pure substance we have uh, aa bonds all right but if i add a solid b in there i will also have ab bonds and uh, some of the bb bonds will bro be broken a bonds will be broken and will form uh, new kinds of bonds and therefore you must get a change in enthalpy and we also have a change in entropy and the contribution of entropy bear in mind scales with temperature okay so at high temperatures entropy matters a lot more uh, in determining the free energy than uh, at low temperatures now entropy has many contributions yeah it, atoms vibrate purely because we are at a finite temperature and that contributes to vibrational entropy due to phonons. Uh, we have electrons in our material and they will be undergoing uh, uh, transitions, etc. cetera, um, in their energy levels. So we have an electronic contribution to entropy and to enthalpy. Uh, we might actually get magnetic transitions so even high entropy alloys have magnetic characteristics. Some of them are ferromagnetic uh, and that can have a very large contribution to the entropy. And we have configurational entropy. And this, is, uh, this takes account of the probability of finding different arrangements of atoms in a mixture of atoms. And, you know, Ye's work, for example, Professor Ye's work, uh, where he coined the term high entropy alloys, focuses on configurational entropy. So I'm going to explain configurational entropy first, uh, just as a revision. You may already have come across it, but nevertheless, it's good to uh, rattle your brains again. So imagine that we have two different kinds of atoms. Uh, the blue, uh, the black and the red atoms. And the black atoms are located on one side of our lattice and the red atoms on the other side. Then there is only one configuration, one arrangement, which will give me the picture illustrated here with black atoms on this side and red atoms on that side. However, if I allow them to mix, then many other possibilities uh, arise. I've only illustrated three of them here. Uh, so here we have a black atom which has gone here and a red atom there and so on. So the chances of obtaining uh, a more random mixture are greater than of obtaining an ordered arrangement like this. Assuming that we are just talking about entropy and not enthalpy. Okay. So let's assume that the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So this is a much more probable set of arrangements. And there are many, many, because there are many, many more of these kinds of arrangements than an ordered array like this. So we, we need to work out how many different arrangements are possible uh, for, for example, for a, a random mixture of atoms, because we are assuming that 
there is no change in bond energies when we mix these atoms. There's no change in enthalpy. The enthalpy change is zero. Okay, so let's just focus on a binary solution where we have a total of capital N number of atoms. Okay, um, that's the total number of atoms and therefore the total number of lattice sites that we have. Of that, Na number of atoms of A type and therefore Nb, which is simply capital N minus Na atoms of type B. And here is my lattice with capital N sites. And I place uh, an A atom on this lattice. Then there are obviously N different ways in which I can place the atom, a, a atom. I can place it there, 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 or any of the lattice points out of the total of N lattice points. Then I place the second A atom uh, and I can place it on n minus one positions because one of the positions is occupied by the atom that we placed initially. So the total number of arrangements of a pair of atoms is n into n minus one, but we have to divide by two because I can't really distinguish, the atoms are not labeled, the atoms are not labeled, so I can't distinguish by uh, an atom A being here uh, and uh, the second atom being here or the second atom being here and the first atom being at this position. So I have to divide by two. Now, if I add a third atom, then I have a choice of n minus two positions where I can place the third atom because two of those positions are already occupied. And I have to divide by three factorial because there are six different uh, indistinguishable ways of arranging the three atoms onto the n sites. So you can see a pattern emerging here. And if you focus on this uh, equation, uh, then um, the total number of ways in which I can arrange the A atoms onto a lattice of N points is N into N minus one into N minus two, N minus three, and so on until all of the A atoms are used up. That's the total number of ways in which it can be arranged. And I want to avoid counting equivalent arrangements. You know, uh, when we swapped one and two and two and one, that's, that doesn't actually uh, make for two arrangements, but for one. So we divide by an A factorial. And this quantity here, uh, which stops when we reach, uh, uh, when we have consumed all the A atoms is equal to n factorial divided by n a factorial and therefore sorry divided by n b factorial so the total number of arrangements i can have is n factorial over n a factorial times n b factorial total number of configurations so how do we from this get the configurational entropy well you know if i have two different lattices uh, and different numbers of arrangements in each. I can't put them together and say that the total number of configurations will be W1 plus W2 because W is not a capacity property of the system. Whereas, you know, entropy is a capacity property. If I take two lumps with different entropies, add them together, uh, then I, I can genuinely add them together. And to illustrate that, you know, supposing you have a dice with six sides, then the chances of drawing, uh, throwing two sixes is one upon six squared and not one upon six plus one upon six. So Boltzmann realized that to make this configurational entropy an additive property, I have to take the logarithm of W. And therefore, he concluded that the configurational entropy S is proportional to the logarithm of W and K is the proportionality constant, which we now call the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so the configurational entropy is given by K log the number of arrangements. So going back to this equation, I need to take the logarithm of this. Now bear in mind that for a real material, capital N will be incredibly large. You know, if we have a mole of atoms, 
then n will be 10 to the power of 23 is 6.0 to 3 times 10 to the power of n 23 that's called Avogadro's number so that's very large and when when the number is very large uh, we want to take the logarithms of factorials we can use an approximation which is known as Stirling's approximation that log of y factorial is y log y minus y okay it's a very good approximation when y is extremely large and we use that approximation in the Boltzmann equation and we discover that our entropy of mixing is the Boltzmann constant times the Avogadro's number for a mole of atoms so this is the molar entropy of mixing into xa log xa plus xp log xp where x is the mole fraction of a atoms that means it's the number of a atoms divided by Avogadro's number and similarly xb is the mole fraction of the b atoms so this is the equation for the configurational entropy of mixing assuming that we have a random distribution of atoms all right that's quite an important assumption and we will challenge that later on when we talk about high entropy alloys but it's basically saying that this is an ideal solution that means that the enthalpy of mixing is zero we don't get any changes in the energies of the bonds when we mix together the a and b atoms so this is the configurational entropy of mixing and i'll plot it on the next slide where you can see that it reaches a maximum at exactly 0 0.5 okay that's an important point when we come to high entropy alloys because we want to mix the constituents in equal concentrations in order to get the largest entropy of mixing and of course if i multiply the entropy of mixing by minus the temperature then i get the free energy of mixing here and the free energy of mixing is a minimum uh, in in with the assumptions that we made when we have equal amounts of A and B and that really is the basis of the high entropy alloy concept that we mix equal amounts of the constituents to maximize the entropy of mixing and therefore the to min, uh, get the largest free energy change when we mix these solutes together and that equation, the configurational entropy of mixing, can be generalized to any number of components where, you know, we have, let's say, if we have five components, then J would be five, and you would have five of these terms in this equation. And these are some calculations, um, a very simple substitutions into this equation, where we see that when we have two components, the entropy of mixing is 5.74. Okay, so that's a, a two component system. When we have three components, it increases. When we have five components, it's 13.4 joules per Kelvin per mole. So this, this is just a ternary diagram in which we are mixing three things together and obtaining your entropies of mixing. And the maximum entropy of mixing is obtained when we have equal concentrations of A, B, and C, which is the uh, center of this triangle as expected from this equation and this is what you get right in the middle of this uh, pink um, region okay so by using lots of components in equal concentrations we can have quite a large entropy of mixing okay and some people define a high entropy alloy as when the entropy of mixing is of the order of 15 joules per Kelvin per mole. But I think we want to ab abandon these arbitrary definitions um, because the actual problem is more complicated than this. Some people even say that, uh, you know, you can't have a high entropy alloy if you don't have five components in equal amounts. But we are going to abandon all those arbitrary definitions okay now let's see if there already exist 
mass-produced alloys which are used in engineering structures which have entropies of mixing of this order okay so i did a search uh, in the literature and i found some alloys so here for example is a binary alloy a nickel 20 chromium weight percent alloy and you know if you look at the phase diagram of iron chromium there's a large solid solution region here where chromium and nickel mix happily and this particular alloy is you is very oxidation resistant so it's the alloy that's used to make uh, these heating filaments in the um, you know electric fan heaters and various kinds of hair dryers and so forth so that is a concentrated alloy it contains 20 weight percent of chromium to help with oxidation resistance and it's a single phase fcc alloy here's another one this is a twinning induced plasticity alloy which has four components iron 25 weight percent of manganese three weight percent of silicon and three weight percent of aluminium commercially available and with interesting properties where a very large elongation starts off quite weak and then strengthens up as a function of strain to something like 1.2 gigapascals and this this nice work hardening ability comes from the fact that you get mechanical twinning it's austenitic but you get mechanical twinning and that mechanical twinning divides up the austenite into smaller and smaller domains as you deform and therefore you get what's known as a dynamic hole patch effect uh, where the smaller and smaller regions therefore become stronger and stronger and you need work hardening to get a high ductility because otherwise you get a plastic instability during a tensile test and again all of these elements are in solid solution in the austenite at equilibrium right i emphasize equilibrium that means no matter how long i hold it uh, at temperature it will still remain as austenite then we have uh, uh, sorry so again you know this is an austenitic alloy uh, and of course the reason is that there is a very large region here uh, when we get to 25 uh, percent of manganese we will end up with uh, fully austenitic material until you go to extremely high concentrations of manganese when other things happen on the other hand, silicon and aluminium, and I want you to remember this when we come to discuss higher entropy alloys, both form a sort of a gamma loop. In other words, beyond a certain concentration, you completely eliminate the FCC, all right? And this is the case for aluminium as well, that beyond a certain concentration, all the way from the melting temperature, you will only get body-centered cubic crystal structures. So they are you know in conventional terminology you can classify these two elements as ferrite stabilizers so when designing alloys and you want to obtain a crystal structure you can get guidance from your binary phase diagrams on what possible structure you're likely to get so you could have predicted from phase diagram calculations that yes this would be fcc here is another concentrated alloy, which is 55 copper, 18 nickel, and 27 zinc, and classically known as nickel silver because it's used for making ornaments of this kind. Uh, very beautiful animals which don't corrode and, you know, which uh, look silvery. All elements are in solid solution. So it is possible to buy commercial alloys which are extremely concentrated. And I calculated the entropies of mixing and you know for the trip steel it's a, a six uh, sorry for the nichrome here it is 4.38 for the trip steel it's 6.76 for the nickel silver is 10 point, uh, 8.24 and this is now approaching uh, this particular austenitic stainless steel is approaching the high entropy alloys okay it's not quite up to 13.4 but that is quite a high entropy of mixing and all of these are successful commercial alloys so we should ask ourselves a question uh, how realistic is it to focus on configurational entropy you know 
are we actually pursuing the wrong concept in thinking about configurational entropy alone? Well, I'm going to say no. I think configurational entropy is extremely important. And I'll show you why it is extremely important. So when we have pure A and pure B and they don't feel each other's presence at all, uh, so we've mixed them up and there are lumps of A and lumps of B, that's what we call a mechanical mixture. And the total free energy is simply the weighted average of the free energy of the A and the free energy of the pure B. You simply add up these two weighted by their amounts. Okay, So this is not at all a solution. There is no mixing of atoms. These are just separate lumps of metal that you put together. Now, as we demonstrated, as soon as we uh, cause mixing, the entropy of mixing will contribute to the free energy of mixing and assuming that we have an ideal solution, that means that the enthalpy of mixing is zero, we will get a dramatic reduction in the free energy. In other words, an atomic mixture is favored relative to uh, you know, lumps of metal being separate. So it is a valid concept to think about in, when we are thinking about making solutions. And let's, uh, let me um, just remind you about defects, all right? So defects can be of many kinds, but one of the most important defects is vacancies in metals. So imagine that we have a, a metal in which there are n, uh, n lattice sites and there are small n vacancies. And delta G is the free energy per atom and delta H is the enthalpy to create one defect. So delta G here, the free energy uh, of uh, an atom in our system of n entities uh, will, will be affected by the number of defects, the number of vacancies we have. So this is the enthalpy of formation of one vacancy. And this term here opposes the formation of vacancies. But when you introduce a vacancy in a pure material, you will change the number of ways in which the atoms can be arranged. And therefore, we have a contribution to the configurational entropy when you form a vacancy inside your metal, and that will favor the formation of vacancies. So this opposes and this favors. If you differentiate this uh, and set this uh, to zero, differentiate it with respect to the number of vacancies, then we find an astonishing result, okay? That there will be an equilibrium number of vacancies, okay? That means no matter how careful your processing is or how careful you are in avoiding perturbations, you will have an equilibrium number of defects in your system, which is given by, uh, which is related to the free energy of formation of a vacancy. You cannot get rid of those defects, okay? And that is entirely due to this term here, which is the configurational entropy of mixing of vacancies with the atoms. So without that, we would not have an equilibrium distribution of vacancies inside all the materials that we see. And this is why uh, diffusion happens easily in solids. Okay, so when you have a vacancy, an atom can jump into that vacancy and therefore we have translated the atom by one spacing here, okay? Now, when I say easily, you know, if you ask a common person, they will find it astonishing that we can actually get diffusion through a solid, all right? But we know that we can actually get diffusion through a solid and it's a lot, lot easier because of the presence of vacancies. And this was proven by um, uh, Schmiegelkas and Kirkcaldy uh, first, um, where they showed that you need a vacancy mechanism to explain diffusion in metals because 
processes like this, where you know you get an exchange of atoms by ring, uh, by a coordinated movement of atoms in a ring, are much much more difficult than an atom jumping into a vacancy and the vacancy moving in the other direction. Without configurational entropy, uh, uh, unless you process the material with severe deformation and so on, it will be very difficult to get diffusion through the solid state. So that is one major consequence of configurational entropy. Now, the other major consequence is when we look at the strength of a material, we must think about the size of the material because as soon as we make the material large the strength will collapse because the probability of finding equilibrium defects or non-equilibrium defects as well but let's focus on equilibrium defects like vacancies becomes greater as the size increases therefore if you measure the strength of a carbon nanotube or graphene at extremely small size which is what is done in practice the strength will collapse as the size increases. So there is no hope of making a structural material out of carbon nanotubes or graphene, because structural materials, you need a length greater than a few micrometers. So this is a consequence of defects which you cannot avoid because there is an equilibrium number of defects. So configurational entropy has a very big role to play in, in metallurgy or, or materials in general, actually. Carbon is not uh, a metal. Okay, so um, configurational entropy has huge consequences. And if entropy is, domin is the dominant contribution to free energy, it becomes feasible to stabilize a multi-component solution and that is the basis of uh, most of the early work on high entropy alloys that we want to stabilize a multi-component solution by maximizing the entropy of mixing okay so i've introduced quite a lot of concepts and we'll build on these to uh, in the next two lectures but I'd like to stop now and answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so I'll, I'll just uh, stop sharing the screen. And answer any questions that you may have. So I think you can unmute yourself uh, if you want to ask a question. Or if you like, you can put it into the chat box. So remember that I'm leaving. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead. Yes, sir. It's nice uh, discussion. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving us the knowledge about this. Sir, uh, my question is, uh, but uh, I want to know what will be the sir, contribution of uh, your, uh, instead of configuration entropy, uh, what will be the contribution of other entropies, like your vibrational entropies and others mm -hmm. in case of high entropy alloys? Yeah, so I think that is a very good question. And let me give you an example to illustrate why we need to think about the other contributions. So you know that pure iron at very high temperature starts off as body-centered cubic. And then as it cools, it becomes face-centered cubic. But then as it cools further, it becomes body-centered cubic, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a unique element that it starts off as BCC at high temperatures, changes into FCC, and back into BCC. Now, why does that happen? It happens almost entirely because of the magnetic contribution to entropy. So the BCC form uh, undergoes a paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition, and that has uh, that magnetic entropy change has a very big effect in stabilizing that relative to the austenite. Okay? And those entropy changes happen even above the Curie temperature because you know it's only long range ordering that we consider below the Curie temperature, but there are other effects going on. And the austenite itself 
has magnetic properties which we cannot ignore so if i add for example 20 percent nickel then we stabilize a particular form of austenite which is ferromagnetic okay so magnetic terms have a big effect and when i come later to talk about the crystal structures of the high entropy alloys i will point out some amazing uh, correlations which indicate perhaps okay so i'm speculating which indicate perhaps that we need to take account of the magnetic contribution to entropy yeah, apart from that sir thank you sir uh, what about this sir, called vibration entropy vibration entropy yes yeah so um in case of yeah so so vibrational entropy uh, of course it contributes to heat capacity and therefore it contributes to uh, the total free energy change but i don't know um, myself how much of an effect that is when we come to consider high entropy alloys those terms uh, are all dealt with actually for uh, iron alloys and nickel alloys and so forth but that information is essentially missing for high entropy alloys where equal amounts of many different elements. So that's where thermodynamic data would be needed and those thermodynamic data would eventually go into phase diagram calculation methods. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. So um, someone is asking about the Hume-Rothery rules and I will come back to those in lectures two and three, okay? And uh, there's another question which says, um, the Cantor alloy, for example, is uh, only FCC uh, and uh, violates some of the hume rothery rules. But I will discuss those in detail in lectures two and three. Can I, can I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. I am Professor N.K. Mukhopadhyay from IIT BIT Varanasi. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask a question which comes as a confusion to many people that uh, high entropy alloy, for example, five elements you have shown that entropy, configurational entropy in the range of 1.6 R in that 14.38. Mm -hmm. But that for any five elements, if you add it, you are supposed to expect this 1.6 R. But that is the assumption when you are getting a random solute solution. Yeah. But when you don't get a random solute solution, then uh, you cannot uh, say that this is your configurational entropy. So the confusion is as follows, that five elements doesn't mean when you mix it together, you will be able to achieve this much of configurational entropy. You can achieve when it is a completely random solid solution even in case of ordered or even in case of splitting into multiple phases which happens in many of the five element system your configurational entropy claiming that it is a high entropy uh, kind of configurational entropy i think that is not a correct claim what is your views uh, you are absolutely right first of all that uh... It's entirely based on assuming that we have a random mixture of atoms. And in the later lecture, I will show you how to do the calculation properly. Uh, the actual entropy of mixing will be reduced quite a lot when we have a finite enthalpy of mixing. However, there's one, one point. If we are talking about alloys designed for use at room temperature, then it is possible that below about 0 0.8 of the melting temperature, nothing much happens when you cool the alloy, okay? If you cool it uh, reasonably rapidly, then you will retain the structure that was present at uh, 0 0.8 of the melting temperature. Now, what that means is that, you know, the contribution of configurational entropy or entropy in general is highest at high temperatures. And the atoms will be completely randomly mixed at a sufficiently high temperature because that is the dominant 
uh, term in the free energy of mixing. So if the structure is essentially frozen below about 0 0.8 of the melting temperature, then you will end up with a random mixture, even though the enthalpy of mixing is non-zero, simply because it's a non-equilibrium structure. And that might be perfectly acceptable to use if you want the alloy uh, for uh, an ambient temperature application. But if you want it for an elevated temperature application, that probably uh, may not be stable. But I'll, I'll define the meaning, meaning of stability properly in the next lecture. Thank you. And uh, can I ask another small question? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. See, suppose you have a five elements and you are putting together. And if you are following a non-equilibrium processing technique, for example, high energy ball milling, you get a single phase solid solution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no problem. The moment you do the heat treatment, you get three, two, several phases just precipitating out of it and it is no more a single phase solid solution or it is not a so to say high entropy solid solution kind of situation. So the question is then when we are doing the high entropy, uh, the, sorry, non-equilibrium processing like high energy ball milling or rapid solidification. So what is happening here that uh, high entropy effect, I think though people may like to interpret but I don't think that high entropy effect is important here. Here the system is driven from the equilibrium system, so you are in a metastable situation. Yes, uh, I mean that that is absolutely right. Uh, the process of uh, mechanical alloying, if you like, is very well established, and uh, it doesn't rely on the entropy of mixing. It's basically forcing forcing uh, the constituents together. Okay, so uh, you will not necessarily get an equilibrium alloy. So I think when you do research, you have to focus on whether you want to use the material uh, in circumstances where there will be no change over a long period of time, or you want to use it at an elevated temperature where things might happen which deteriorate the, the sample. And the same applies to you know the dilute alloys that I mentioned earlier, that you know, some of them would not perform at all well at high temperatures because they are designed for ambient temperature applications. Thank you. There's a question on the chat which says, uh, are high entropy metastable solutions always? The answer is no. Um, and I think that the tendency now uh, is to even think about two-phase high entropy alloys, you know. Uh, so when we go to the refractory high entropy alloys, people are thinking about sort of emulating the structure that we get in the nickel-based super alloys of gamma prime and gamma precipitates mixed together. Okay, we have time for one more question if we are to end exactly on time. 